Hi, it's Katrina. From an enemy of Rome famous for its war elephants to a state made up of warrior tribes, here are nine destroyed countries and empires that no longer exist. Number 9. North Sea Empire Toward the end of the Viking Age, the kingdoms of England, Denmark, and Norway united to form the Norse-ruled North Sea Empire, also known as the Anglo-Scandinavian Empire. This was a thalassocracy, which means a state that has control over a large expanse of sea. It was first united under Swayan Forkbeard, king of both Sweden and Denmark, who conquered England in 1013. But he died the following year, and everything broke up into fragments. Forkbeard's son, Canute the Great, quickly resumed his father's work and conquered England again in 1016. Two years later, he acquired Denmark, and in 1028, Canute conquered Norway. During this time, he nearly became the most powerful ruler in Western Europe, second only to the Holy Roman Emperor. Canute promoted the interests of the church, gaining such favor among Europeans' Christian rulers that no other Scandinavian king had ever achieved. He also traveled frequently, indicating that he had a tight grip on his rule over England while leaving Denmark under the control of his regents. In the years leading up to his death, Canute made plans for different sons to inherit factions of his empire, suggesting that he had not deliberately united them in the first place, and did not necessarily plan for them to remain under one ruler. He probably realized how hard that would be. Consequently, the empire immediately collapsed when Canute died in 1035. Five years later, his Danish successor, Hartha Canute, inherited England and ruled it until he died suddenly in 1042. Then, Magnus of Norway conquered Denmark with plans to do the same in England, but was quickly ejected from Denmark, marking the end of the North Sea Empire. Number 8. Carthage Ancient Carthage, also known as the Punic Republic, was an informal federation of Phoenician city-states that dominated parts of North Africa and modern-day Spain. As one of the longest-lived and largest states in the ancient Mediterranean, the powerful empire lasted from 575 BC to 146 BC. Its constant state of struggle with the Roman Republic is what ultimately led to its downfall in a series of conflicts known as the Punic Wars. It was during the Second Punic War that the Carthaginian general Hannibal, considered one of history's greatest military minds, commanded the empire's main forces against Rome. The Carthaginian Republic fell at the end of the Third Punic War in the Battle of Carthage, when Roman forces led by General Scipio Aemilianus rebounded from years of defeat under Hannibal. The Romans laid siege to the kingdom's capital city, Carthage, in a campaign of all-out destruction, burning Phoenician warships and buildings, and enslaving as many as 50,000 residents, and in the process, ending Carthaginian power for good. After Carthage was reduced to rubble, the majority of its colonies were annexed to the Roman Empire. Number 7. East Germany In 1949, East Germany, or the German Democratic Republic, became a Soviet satellite state as part of the Potsdam Agreement, which divided up conquered territories among the Allies after the Second World War. Basically, Germany was split in half, and even though people were from the same country, they became isolated. If your family was on the other side of the line, it was very difficult to even see them. While Soviet forces remained present throughout the Cold War, East Germany was officially governed by the Socialist Unity Party of Germany. Marxist-Leninist teachings and the Russian language were core requirements of the educational system. In what's known as a centrally planned economy, most of the country's infrastructure was state-owned. Instead of letting supply and demand determine prices, the government controlled and heavily subsidized the costs of basic goods and services. While affordable living might sound great in theory, many people found the policies of the self-described workers and peasant state to be suffocating. Those in Western Germany and the Western world in general considered East Germany to be the product of a controlling communist regime. The country's television, radio, film, and music industries were state-run, giving the government nearly complete control over people's access to information. Citizens also had extremely limited job opportunities and access to material wealth, and people began leaving the country for places with more freedom and better opportunities. The exodus threatened to weaken East Germany's economy, so the government built the Berlin Wall in 1961. This would now be the restrictive border that was patrolled constantly. Those caught attempting to flee were often shot to death, 
killed by landmines, or imprisoned for long periods of time. But the desire for reunification with West Germany continued to grow over time as the East German government faced mounting debt and food shortages due to rising costs. With as many as 5 million activists campaigning for freedom by late 1989, officials drew up a phased plan to loosen travel and emigration restrictions in hopes of appeasing the growing unrest and unhappiness against the authoritarian government. A spokesperson mistakenly announced that the changes were effective immediately, and citizens flocked to the border in throngs to await passage into West Germany. Aware that the communist bloc needed reform, and knowing the amount of force that it would take to stop the crowd, with some people already climbing over and hammering away at the Berlin Wall, authorities finally opened the barrier. The historic event marked the beginning of the Iron Curtain's fall and the reunification of East and West Germany. Number 6. Marina Kingdom Located off the southeast African coast, the Marina Kingdom controlled much of the island of Madagascar. It was also called the Kingdom of Madagascar and was officially known as the Kingdom of E. Marina. According to legend, the first Marina king, Andriana Renerina, descended from heaven to rule over the Vazimba people, whose presence in the Malagasy Central Highlands dates as far back as the 3rd century. There are no known written records of what went on within the empire prior to the 16th century, leaving historians with limited knowledge of its rulers until that point. But the Marina Kingdom had been around for a very long time. The rulers were descendants of a very long line of Marina royalty, and while the British and the Portuguese and the French were trying to conquer and split up Africa, this empire held strong and also wanted to expand and consolidate its power. King Radama in 1817 had formalized a diplomatic agreement with the British. He would abolish slavery in exchange for British weapons and military training. That way, they could rule the entire island of Madagascar. However, he died, and his queen decided that she was not interested in being friends with any European power. Madagascar would decide its own affairs, and the British could stuff it. The problem was that she was a hardcore ruler. There was forced labor as tax, where people had to work by force to build public works projects and work as soldiers. There was constant warfare, disease, hunger, and instead of a judge and jury, if someone was accused of a crime, they had to eat a poisonous nut. If they survived, they were innocent, but a lot of people died. Records show that during this time, the population was reduced by half. Her enemies spread rumors that she was a tyrant and probably insane. Members of the court started to disagree with the queen, and perhaps the Europeans weren't so bad. Foreign powers decided to become friends with other people at court, for example, her son, Prince Radma II. The French tried to get rid of the queen, but were unsuccessful. She died in her sleep in 1861 after naming her son as successor. He converted to Christianity and ruled for just three years, allowing the European powers to come back in and exploit the land and resources for a price. He was murdered in secret, but this paved the way for the French to come in by force. They invaded Madagascar in 1883 in what became known as the First Franco-Hova War. Following the conflict, France officially annexed Madagascar on January 1, 1896. They exiled the last Marina Queen, Rana Valona II, to Réunion Island and then French Algeria. And that was the end of the empire. Number 5. Volga, Bulgaria Named for the semi-nomadic warrior tribes called the Bulgars, who lived in what is now European Russia between the 7th and 13th centuries, Volga, Bulgaria was a multi-ethnic state situated near the confluence of the Volga and Kama rivers. It came to dominate trade between the Arab, Norse, and Avar groups during its time, owing to its strategic location. Because there are no surviving authentic first-hand records of Volga, Bulgaria, experts know very little about it, and it's really confusing. Their information comes mainly from contemporary sources and what little they've found through archaeological excavations. Although Volga, Bulgaria was primarily a Turkic Bulgar state, Researchers believe that it was originally settled by Finno-Ugric peoples, which consisted of groups from northeastern Europe, North Asia, and the Carpathian Basin in Central Europe. Who learned this in history class? Anyone? Not me. In 632, a man named Kubrat, who had been raised in Constantinople and converted to Christianity and also became a good friend of Emperor Heraclius, led a revolt against the Avars and Gokturks establishing control over most of the Bulgar tribes and creating what the later Byzantine authors called Old Great Bulgaria. 
It was located in modern eastern Ukraine and southern Russia. The Bulgars entered the area that became Volga, Bulgaria as they migrated across Europe and became subject to the semi-nomadic Khazarian Khaganate. There were many tribes here, like the Huns, the Goths, the Magyars, and the Slavs. Kubrat tried to unify them all and left the area to his five sons. They had other ideas and each went with a different tribe. Some Bulgars went north, some south, and developed relationships with the Finno-Ugrian, the Balkan Slavs, and the Romans and the Byzantines. During the late 9th century, Volga Bulgaria became unified and established the capital at Bulgar City. It achieved complete independence in the 10th century, during which time the state adopted Islam. Leading up to the Crusades, Volga Bulgaria controlled much of the trade between Europe and Asia and enjoyed great power. Its only real military threat, the Rus principalities to the west, committed numerous raids throughout the 11th century that devastated the country. Volga Bulgaria was further weakened by the rulers of Vladimir, who systematically pillaged its cities. But its ultimate decline came in 1236 at the hands of the Mongols, who invaded while the country was already destabilized by internal warfare. Volga Bulgars split into two communities based on their religion, the Christians and the Muslims, making it easy for invaders to tear them apart. Number 4. The Kingdom of Ayutthaya Founded in 1350 by King Uthong Ramathibodi in what is now Thailand during the decline of the Khmer Empire, the Siamese Kingdom of Ayutthaya became a major power in Southeast Asia. During its early days, the empire was governed by familial connections under what's called the Mandala system. Over the next 400 years, Ayutthaya expanded to form the nation of Siam, encountering its fair share of obstacles along the way. Ayutthaya fell for the first time in 1569 to Burmese invaders, but the state rebounded and expanded shortly thereafter under King Naresuan. During the 17th century, the kingdom established itself as a center of international trade and became extremely rich and extravagant, rivaling the wealth of some European nations at its height. With far-reaching trade relations with the Chinese, Vietnamese, Japanese, Indians, Persians, Portuguese, Spanish, Dutch, and French, Ayutthaya was known for being friendly toward its trade partners, and even allowed them to establish villages outside the walls of the self-named capital. The empire experienced a golden age during the first half of the 18th century, which emphasized the value of literature, art, and learning in general. But these glory days were short-lived, and Ayutthaya's final years were marked by declining trade and bloody warfare. A 40,000-strong Burmese army invaded Ayutthaya in 1766, embarking on a 14-month campaign of all-out destruction and leaving the capital and major cities in ruins. The majority of Ayutthaya's art treasures, literature, and historical records were destroyed as its four-century rule came to a permanent end. Despite their sweeping defeat, the Burmese only ruled Ayutthaya for a few months until their Chinese adversaries closed in on the region, forcing them to withdraw. Number 3. Empire of Trebizond From 1204 to 1461, the Empire of Trebizond, also called the Trapezuntine Empire, existed as an offshoot of the Byzantine Empire on a narrow strip of land situated along the Black Sea's southern coast. Founded by brothers Alexios and David Komnenos, the last surviving male descendants of the deposed Byzantine Emperor Andronikos I, Trebizond was initially not very powerful in its own right. Instead, it got by mostly through diplomacy, the generosity of foreign rulers like Queen Tamar of Georgia, and the inadvertent benefits of conflicts involving surrounding states, like the Mongol invasion of the region that advantageously diverted the Silk Road to Trebizond. That's convenient. The empire's power and stability peaked in the early 14th century under the long-running rule of Alexios II Megas Komnenos. Following his death, Trebizond erupted into years of civil war that saw seven rulers, including child emperors, between 1330 and 1349. The kingdom restabilized under Alexios III and enjoyed great wealth and power as a trading hub while maintaining its reputation for exemplary diplomacy by keeping amicable ties with other rulers. The practice of marrying off Trapezuntine princesses, who were famous for their beauty and came with large dowries, to powerful neighboring states helped to keep the peace. Trebizond collapsed in just a month's time during the mid-15th century at the hands of the Ottomans. It was the last surviving faction of the Byzantine Empire. Number 2. The Mughal Empire 
Founded in 1526 by a warrior chieftain named Babur with the help of the Safavid and Ottoman empires, the Mughal Empire was a Muslim dynasty that eventually grew to control much of the Indian subcontinent and part of Afghanistan. Unusually tolerant for its time, the kingdom had a diverse elite class, and rulers generally refrained from suppressing their mostly Hindu subjects and their cultures. Its economy was supported largely by agricultural taxes, and the currency was well regulated, enabling peasants and artisans to enter larger markets. It was the Mughal Empire's ability to maintain relative peace within its confines that facilitated its economic expansion during the 17th century. Meanwhile, the growing European presence in the Indian Ocean resulted in an increased demand for raw products from India, and the Mughal Empire's wealth grew even more. As the kingdom became richer, its elites enjoyed greater access to luxuries like literature, artwork, architecture, and textiles. But money eventually began to run out, and the emperor's authority was weakened as he found himself unable to pay many of his high-ranking officials. The military lost its morale amid their exhausting rivalry with more violent opponents, and internal political feuds further weakened the dynasty. Additionally, the decline of religious tolerance and the desire among European merchants and governments to dip their hand into Mughal wealth rapidly destabilized the empire, and by 1750, the dynasty was in the throes of a major crisis. As elites increasingly sought to establish independent control over their affairs, attempts were made to reverse the decline of the fragmenting Mughal Empire. But these efforts failed, and the British East India Company stepped in to protect the kingdom from its adversaries, marking the beginning of the colonial era. The last Mughal emperor was deposed in 1858, at which point the British took full control of India. Number 1. The Kingdom of Hawaii most people know of Hawaii as a U.S. state, but many do not realize that it was once an independent country. The Kingdom of Hawaii originated on Hawaii's Big Island in 1795, under the warrior chief Kamehameha the Great, who went on to conquer the islands of Oahu, Maui, Molokai, and Lanai. In 1810, the islands of Kauai and Nihau voluntarily joined the Hawaiian Kingdom, effectively unifying the archipelago. Major European powers recognized the kingdom, which was ruled by two dynastic families known as the House of Kamehameha and the House of Kalakaua. Meanwhile, the U.S. became Hawaii's biggest trade partner and protected the kingdom from potential invasions and conquest by other powers. In 1887, a crowd of 3,000 residents and armed militia pressured King Kalakaua to sign a new constitution drafted by his interior minister. When his sister, Lili Uakalani took the throne in 1891 amid an economic crisis stemming from U.S.-imposed trade tariffs that hurt Hawaii's sugar exporters, she announced plans to abolish the 1887 constitution and implement a new one. Angry at the proposed changes, local businessmen and politicians, including some Americans, overthrew Queen Lili Uakalani and her cabinet and took over the Hawaiian government in 1893. The U.S. quickly established an official presence in Hawaii, and the Queen formally surrendered the throne under pressure to sign a five-page document, ceding her power in exchange for sparing her supporters from execution. Thanks for watching! Which country or kingdom was your favorite? If you'd like to learn about more countries that no longer exist, let me know in the comments below. And remember to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. We have lots more videos coming up. See you soon! Bye!